of this session is linear time zero knowledge uh, proofs for identity circuit satisfiability by Jonathan Bruto, Andrea Celery, uh, <coughs> Sam Garafi, Jens Groth, uh, Mohamed Hajabadi, Sun K. Jakob, Jakobsen, and Jonathan Rivimoto. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So, zero knowledge proofs, as we've seen, are two party protocols where a prover tries to convince a verifier that some statement is true and the verifier learns nothing at all except for the truth of the statement. So, zero knowledge protocols have three important properties that were already introduced. We've got completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge protocol. Now, our zero knowledge protocols are going to have three more properties. There'll be proofs of knowledge meaning that the prover actually has to know a secret witness in order to convince the verifier to accept. There will be interactive protocols, so the prover and verifier will exchange several messages. And there will be public coin protocols, meaning that all of the verifier's messages are chosen uniformly at random from some set. You can measure the efficiency of zero knowledge protocols relative to the size of the statement that the prover wants to prove. And we can measure the prover computation, the verifier computation, the amount of interaction between the prover and verifier, the size of the messages that they have to communicate, the cost of setting up the protocol. But in previous work, there aren't any examples of zero knowledge proofs with only constant computational overhead for the prover. So where the cost of proving a statement is just directly proportional to the cost of producing the proof. Uh, so that's what we produce as part of our work. We give our zero knowledge protocols for arithmetic circuits. So an arithmetic circuit is a circuit made up of gates labeled with addition or multiplication. Every gate has two input wires and one output wire, and all the wires take values in some field. So in order to compute the circuit, just take two values corresponding to some input wire, apply the operation on the gate, and you get the value for the output wire for that gate. The statement for a zero knowledge proof is a description of some arithmetic circuit with a collection of outputs for the arithmetic circuit. And given this statement, it's an empty complete problem to decide whether valid inputs which satisfy the circuit and give those outputs actually exist. So the prover's witness is going to be a set of valid input wires for the arithmetic circuit. So just skipping ahead to our results, uh, for a large finite field F and an arithmetic circuit with N gates, we give zero knowledge arguments in proof with constant computational overhead for the prover. So that's O of N field multiplications for the prover. Uh, we've got sublinear verification costs, a little O of N field multiplications for the verifier. And we've got O of log log N rounds of interaction between the prover and the verifier. So for our zero knowledge arguments, we actually get a sublinear proof size, that's poly lambda square root N field elements. And security relies only on collision resistant hash functions computable in linear time. So that's quite impressive, even without considering the zero knowledge requirement. These are the first uh, interactive arguments with constant computational overhead for the prover and a succinct or sublinear proof size. Um, when considering zero knowledge proofs with statistical soundness, we get a linear communication cost O of n field elements and then security relies on linear time computable one way functions. We construct our protocols by starting with arithmetic circuits. Uh, converting these into systems of matrix equations, which we then convert into collections of polynomials. Next, we give a proof, a zero knowledge protocol, in an idealized model called the ideal linear commitment model. Our next step is to construct uh, efficient linear time computable commitments. And finally, we use our commitment scheme to convert our ideal protocol into real zero knowledge proofs and arguments. So the prover begins by arranging all of the wire values for the arithmetic circuit into six matrices, depending on whether the wire value is a left input, a right input, or an output of a particular gate, and whether the gate is an addition gate or a multiplication gate. 
in order to verify that all the multiplication gates in the circuit are computed correctly, we have to check that the entry product of the first two matrices in the top row is equal to the third matrix. And in order to check that all of the addition gates in the circuit were correctly computed, we have to verify that the sum of the two matrices in the bottom row is equal to the third matrix. Now, there are also some output wires from gates which feed into the inputs of other gates and some Y values which are duplicated. So we also have to check that certain values in the matrices are equal. We do this by showing that if we swap certain pairs of values in the matrices, then the matrices that we end up with are exactly the same. And this reduces to doing computations using a public permutation matrix. <laughs> So that's, that's a small example of what we would do for this small circuit. Uh, for larger circuits, we just use larger matrices. And in order to get optimal communication efficiency in our protocol, we choose matrices of dimensions roughly a square root of n by a square root of n, where n is the number of gates in the arithmetic circuit. OK. so. Previous protocols work by having the prover commit to collections of row vectors using some kind of homomorphic commitment scheme. The verifier then sends a random challenge x to the prover. The prover opens some linear combination of these committed row vectors. And then the verifier checks that these openings are correct. If you have a homomorphic, homomorphic commitment scheme, as in previous works, this is very easy. You can use the homomorphic commitment scheme to uh, to compute a commitment to the linear combination, which can then be checked. The verifier uses these linear combinations to compute various polynomials with circuit satisfiability embedded into the coefficients, and that's how the verifier checks that the circuit is satisfiable. Uh, so we're going to abstract away some of the properties of this protocol using this model, an ideal linear commitment model. So in this model, we provide the prover and verifier with an additional functionality, the ILC, which allows the prover to commit to row vectors and the verifier to query linear combinations of these row vectors in a trusted manner. There are some parts of the protocol, for example, uh, the computations with this public permutation matrix, where the verifier would have to compute some very complicated expressions in publicly known values. And if we ask the verifier to do this by themselves, um, as in previous works, this would lead to linear or even superlinear computational costs for the verifier. So instead of doing this, we outsource as much of the work as possible to the prover. So we ask the prover to commit to various public matrices, and then the verifier simply requests linear combinations of the rows of these matrices in order to get the expressions that they want rather than computing by themselves. And this leads to sublinear verification times. In order to construct our commitment schemes, our first ingredient is <coughs> linear error correcting code. Now, in order to achieve the efficiency results that we want with constant computational overhead, uh, we need a linear error correcting code, which is encodable in linear time, and to get uh, good security for our arguments, we need an error correcting code with a linear minimum distance. One example of such a code was given by Druk and Ishai. Uh, this satisfies all of, all of our requirements. Actually, if we were to use a different linear error correcting code, which wasn't linear time encodable, it would still work. We would still get a secure construction. We just wouldn't be able to get uh, this constant computational overhead for the prover. Uh, we don't use the codes exactly as given by Druk and Ishai. We actually add some randomness and produce a randomized encoding scheme in order to get the zero knowledge property. We will also need a collision resistant hash function computable in linear time if we want to get hiding commitments. And in this case, we use the construction of hiding commitments given by Apple Bernadal. On the other hand, if we want to get perfectly binding commitments, then we use a construction based on linear time computable one-way functions given by Ishai and we can achieve both flavors of commitments. In order to actually commit to the Y values in the circuit, the prover starts off with this matrix of Y values that we saw before. 
applies the error correcting code to every row of the matrix separately, and then applies one of the commitment schemes that we just saw to every column of the new encoded matrix. So that's one commitment for every column in the matrix on the right hand side. Later, when the prover wants to open these commitments to different linear combinations, the prover computes the linear combination and sends it to the verifier. The verifier then checks this linear combination by applying the error correcting code to the value sent by the prover, and then using openings of the columns of commitments sent earlier to perform spot checks on this linear combination. And if our error correcting code has a very high minimum distance, then the verifier is very likely to catch a cheating prover. Even when we compile our ideal protocol into a real protocol using this method, we still have sublinear verification costs. In fact, uh, the linear costs are all with the prover in computing these linear combinations, and the verifier's costs are encoding and performing these spot checks, which is still sublinear costs. Okay, so we can use this technique using the Heine commitments of Apple Bangtar to get zero knowledge arguments with perfect completeness, computational soundness, and statistical special honest verifier zero knowledge. Or we can use the perfectly binding commitments of Ishai et al. to get zero knowledge proofs with perfect completeness, statistical soundness, and computational special honest verifier zero knowledge. Here's how the protocol actually looks between a prover and a verifier. The prover starts off by committing to a matrix of all of these Y values. Uh, this is roughly a square root of 10 row vectors. And they send all of these commitments to the verifier. The verifier sends back a random challenge. And now the prover uses this random challenge to compress the number of row vectors into a new collection of square root of 10 over 2 row vectors uh, using techniques similar to those in previous work, like uh, growth 2009. The prover and verifier actually repeat this process for log log n rounds with log log n random challenges, and the prover uses the same compression technique to compress the number of row vectors from a square root n to square root n over log n. And the reason for this compression is if we try to give arguments directly with square root n row vectors, we would get some superlinear computational costs for the prover. If we apply already known techniques to square root n over log n vectors, then we can get linear computational costs for the prover using fewer vectors. So at this point, after all of the compression, the prover and verifier engage in arguments similar to those in growth 2009 in order to, um, in order to verify that uh, the committed values um, are part of matrices which satisfy this product condition, this addition condition, and the correct permutation condition too. The prover sends a constant number of linear combinations to open all of these committed values to the verifier. Finally, the verifier randomly selects a set of indices which tell the prover which columns that they should open. The prover opens commitments corresponding to all of the columns specified in this random set I, sends these to the verifier. And finally, the verifier can use all of these commitments to do the spot checks on the columns of all of the code words. Here's a comparison of our zero knowledge arguments relative to previous zero knowledge arguments. At the top, we have some classic work by Kramer and Damgold, which is based on the discrete logarithm assumption. Now, since this protocol relies on person commitments and exponentiations in finite groups, uh, straight away we have this computational overhead of a uh, security parameter in the previous computation. Uh, the same applies to previous works like Growth09 and So09. And in fact, SNARKs also use exponentiation in finite groups, so they have this same computational overhead of the security parameter. Uh, further down, we've got PCP based constructions of Ben Sassmetal and some concurrent work featuring at uh, CCS this year called the Gero. Uh, these also rely on collision-resistant hash functions, but importantly, they both fail to achieve constant computational overhead for the prover, and neither of them actually achieve sublinear verification costs, uh, like our work does. Um, 
Um, so to sum up, we have the first zero-knowledge proofs and arguments with constant computational overhead for the prover and sublinear verification time. Our arguments have uh, sublinear communication cost and security is solely based on either collision-resistant hash functions for our arguments or one-way functions for our zero-knowledge proofs. Thanks very much. about the sublinear part in the verification. Is yeah. it, what is the trade-off in sending it to something? Is it with communication? Because um, the way you describe it, you kind of left it open. If you set it to square root, do you get square root communication? If you set it to third root, do you get something larger than communication? Is it a trade-off like that? Um, I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Just the same sublinear verification. Yeah. Um, can you specify like uh, exactly how, how, is that tunable, the sublinear part? Is it a trade-off between setting it to something and paying it somewhere else? Oh, okay. Um, the sublinear verification cost is not tunable. So let's go back. Um, the sublinear verification cost comes from um, the verifier actually applying the error correcting code to, to many different vectors. Um, so since the since the error correcting code actually has a linear time encoding cost, uh, the verification cost isn't tunable. Other questions or comments? We still have a lot of time. So, okay. Can I have a question? Uh, you, you say that your result is in, uh, you have concurrent work very big. Could you explain the kind of the concurrent work? Uh, explain. Sure, yeah. Okay, so um, Ligero was concurrent work, which was presented at uh, CCS this year. Uh, Ligero actually uses some very similar techniques using error correcting codes and collision resistant hash functions. Uh, but there are two big differences with um, Ligero compared to our work. Um, so, uh, firstly, they, firstly, they don't achieve this uh, constant computational overhead. Uh, that's because the error correcting codes that they use are uh, read solving codes, uh, which are more complicated to encode. Um, so you could ask the question, um, why not use these linear time encodable codes in, in their work? Could you not get the same results as us? Uh, so the other important difference with this Ligero protocol is they use the multiplicative property of read solving codes. Uh, we don't actually use any special property like that of, uh, of our error correcting codes. Um, so, as a result, our techniques are slightly more general. Um, we could, in fact, use read solving codes in our construction to get the same complexity as the Gero, um, but since they use this special property, um, they couldn't actually instantiate their protocol with our error correcting codes and get the same results as us. Thank you. Um, let me ask one more. So, can we? Uh, apply the fiat shamia to obtain a non entropy version of your proof? Uh, yeah, you can apply the fiat shamia transformation and get a non interactive protocol. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, let, let me ask one more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, from what kind of assumptions can we have linear time causal reason hash or one, one way function? Um, let's see, I forget the assumption which the linear time one-way function is based on, but as for the linear time collision resistant hash function, uh, that's based on, if I'm not mistaken, that's based on an assumption, it looks like a last assumption or something close to an assumption from coding theory. Sorry? Um, that's yeah, that looks like an assumption that comes from uh, coding, coding theory. It's not like LW or... LPN. Uh, no, it's not LWE or LPN. It's a, it's a different assumption. Thank you. Okay, if there are no questions, then let's thank the speaker and uh, all speakers in this session. <laughs>